Okay, welcome to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Uh, for Sunday school this morning, we're going over Old Testament and New Testament examples of faithfulness. Uh, <laughs> to excuse, um, I didn't have access to a printer and my computer for a good part of the week, so I ended up having to just hand write it out. Oh, and good. I made a photocopy. If it's not legible, I can, I'll print it out. Uh, try and see if I can get to it tonight to print it out for you. Um, so we're uh, second week in our uh, series on faithfulness and commitment, and we looked at what faithfulness and commitment was last week as far as defining the word and then seeing what scripture has to say with regard to faithfulness and being faithful or being found faithful. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen that really is just standing out is that Everybody can be faithful. In other words, it's not something that's unique to some particular individual. You don't have to be some superman, but rather it's a choice of the will. Uh, and so if you're not faithful, it's because you don't want to be. Uh, it, you can be if you want to be faithful. Um, God expects, of it, expects us to be faithful. We're commanded to be faithful in part, not only just because it's a direct command from God, but also it's a reflection of his character and since we're called by his name and since we're, we're now uh, for those that are born again uh, we have his name upon us and if we're going to be like Christ that is something that is hi good morning we're to be like Christ in him, and that is is faithful in our character uh, so this morning we want to look at some examples uh, we're looking just for uh, there's countless examples that we go uh, in scripture concerning faithful people and then you have, um, if you wanted to, even like in Hebrews 11, uh, the, the chapter of faith, the hall of faith, you got the number of folks that were mentioned in there uh, with regard to their testimony of having been faithful to the Lord. But today we're just going to look at four examples, two from the Old Testament and then two from the New Testament, uh, and two of which, uh, we'll see they have some bad aspects to them. But uh, first one, we're going to go to Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35. Go to Jeremiah 35. Okay. Um, to really get the context, you'd have to read the whole chapter. But I'll, I'm going to get through here and then summarize some, but we'll start at verse 1, uh, Jeremiah 35. It says, the word of the Lord, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took uh, uh, Zaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Papa Zaniah and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdalia, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was of the chamber of Messiah, the son of Shalem, the keeper of the door. Okay, and I set before them, I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, we will drink no wine. And here's the reason they give for this. Is, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall not drink, uh, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons, forever. Neither shall ye build houses, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days shall ye dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. And then thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all that he has charged us to drink no wine at all. Uh, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters. And if you go on down, he's going to tell them as far as as well that he, they didn't plant vineyards and they've been living in tents, so they've been sojourning. All right, so skip down to the end, uh, verse 18. Uh, and Jeremiah said unto the house of Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he hath commanded you. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. So in other words, it's God's blessing them because they've been faithful to keep the command that a forefather of them had commanded them. Uh, and they were brought forth initially as an example to the house of Israel because the house of Israel had been going into idolatry quite a bit. And so he pointed out, these are Rechabites. They're not even Jewish, right? These are people that are sojourning in the land that have been there for a number of years since probably even going into uh, from during the conquest or, or a little bit prior. Now, of the... Um, of what I could find with regard to, because they're mentioned again in Second Kings chapter 10 and then in First Chronicles, as we see on our outline, Second Kings chapter 10 and then in First Chronicles chapter 2, as far as where uh, some of the same similar account and then uh, there, um, in Second Kings in particular, uh, Jonadab, or he's also known as Jehonadab, uh, was somebody that was um, faithful to God, even though he wasn't uh, Jewish. Uh, and even though he didn't really have any kind of tie to any of the promises of God as an Israelite would. You know, he didn't have a promise of land. Uh, he didn't have a promise of blessing or anything like that. But he believed God, and he was somebody that was faithful to God. So he was a follower of God. Uh, interestingly enough, in, second, in the Second Kings account, he joins with uh, Jehu. And Jehu is the one that was tasked with ridding the land of idolatry, and which he did. Now, he, he was unfaithful towards the end of his life, Jehu was, but he basically killed uh, Ahab and then the house of Ahab, and he was, he, was, he was tasked with basically ridding the land of what would be uh, the idolatry that was in the land because of Jezebel and, and Ahab during that time. And so he went and he helped kill a bunch of false prophets, uh, is what he did. And he helped kill a bunch of individuals that were basically idolaters and spreading idolatry within the land. Uh, he joined Jehu with that. Uh, and so he was faithful to God. Uh, we see he, um, the Rechabites in particular, they faithfully observed God's commands given them by Jonadab, uh, who was Jonadab, and they did that for generations. Okay? Uh, now, I know it seems kind of silly, but like, what's the big deal about this? Why is this so significant? What's, what stands out about this? Why is this something that God would take time to go ahead and write in Scripture uh, as far as what these guys did? Yes. They were faithful to God. And okay. Go ahead. Is this, is this a parenthetical passage in Jeremiah? Is it more uh, kind of not going along with it? It's not really about Israel first. Well, if you read the chapter, God purposely called them because he wanted to use God purposely called them because he wanted to use them as an illustration to the nation of Israel, saying. You are my people that are called by my name. In other words, you have God's law, God's command. They, okay, I, I, say, I say this cautiously because the thing is, as human, whether we're Jewish or Gentile, the fact is we're all under obligation to God to obey him. But they didn't have the law. You know, so I mean, they were exposed to the law but they didn't because of being exposed to Israel. But they didn't have to be... Uh, faithful to God, or they didn't have to be pursuant of God. Uh, so they weren't under obligation, quote unquote, I guess you could say in that sense. But the fact is, they were. And it's then, contrast to Israel, who was not, who had the law. Yeah, and so these, these are Gentiles that are faithful to me. You know, follow ye their example, look to them, is basically what he's pointing out. He's, he's trying to point them out, the fact that, look, you guys are in idolatry, you need to get right yeah. and, and, and flee from your, from your idolatry. So anyway, so what because they were faithful to do that. Now, mind you, they didn't... You would think... Um, all right. I guess you guys would be the only ones that are don't have, I guess, a permanent home necessarily. You have a traveling home. So in a sense, it's kind of like living in tents to a degree. But, I mean, how many of us would 
for generations. Like, okay, I can understand, okay, the, the no wine. Okay, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But you can't settle down. You don't have roots. Okay. You don't, they were specifically told not to plant vineyard, uh, not to build houses, basically not to, no, not to plant in the land. Go ahead. In essence, don't get tempted. You plant vineyards or stuff like that, then you're going to get tempted to settle down. But even today, we know it's true that you in the city, there's more crime and corruption than if you're in the country. Well, the, the point of why they were not to settle, it's not explicitly stated, but here's something that would be kind of understood. Who was the land committed to in which they were in? They're in the promised land, so that means it's promised to Israel. So the inhabitants thereof are basically going to be killed or kicked out. Okay? And then those that would recognize, like you could, well, we'll see here with Rahab, she un, she realized, okay, God's given you the land, you know, spare me. So she was allowed to be in there, and she became a part of Israel. She became later in the line of Christ. Okay, so I'm a little bit jumping ahead here, but the fact is that was God's land that was promised to His people. No, they weren't. Okay, they weren't in that lineage or anything at all. But they believed God and they saw that God. So uh, again, this is conjecture on my part. I believe that was because of the fact that this is this is their land. So we're just going to soldier in here, you know, and then bank on God's mercy. All right, and then you know, obviously this you know one is micro strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Uh, and then as well of the fact that um, they kept that for generations. Now you would think, okay, how many how many people would want how how many how many how often do you see that even just from one generation to the next? Uh, like, say from a father to a son, uh, uh, say from uh, from like a, you know, a grandfather to their grandkids, that you have deviation from where their grandparents stood, or their parents stood, with regard to, you know, faithfulness to God and things that they would preach and teach. You don't see that very often, and so that's something that's pretty unique uh, that we see. And again, they were just. Nomads, just regular people walking about in the land, but they believed God, and they were faithful to God, and they were faithful to be uh, obedient to the command that was given to them. Now, I mean, again, it was didn't seem like any, anything big deal or significant, but the fact is, it's they were faithful to that, and God blessed as a result. Uh, Joshua chapter two, Joshua chapter two. Start at verse one. Uh, we're, we're not going to read. It's kind of a long chapter. We won't read, but we'll skip around a bit. So, okay. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim uh, two men to spy secretly, saying, "Go view the land, even Jericho." And they went and came unto into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, "Behold, there uh, came men in hither uh, tonight." of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence there were. And this is speaking to the individuals that were of her own country looking for the men, looking for the two spies. Uh, and it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue them, or pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. And she brought them up to the roof of, of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in uh, order upon the roof. Um, skip down to verse eight. It says, and before they laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto them. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, 
and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we heard, or excuse me, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites uh, that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And then as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither uh, did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And then now she's going to start pleading for her family, for her own life and then for her family. If we read on to the rest of the chapter, then what happens is she makes them take an oath. She commits unto them, says, look, I'll let you guys, I won't say anything, I'll hide, but just let me live and let my family live. My father's house, my brother's house, and basically her whole family. Uh, she wanted to have rescue. Uh, what takes place is that they say um, they give them to the oath, they give an oath unto her and they said okay when we come in uh, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll overpass your house but here's how we get to know that it's your place and or how anybody would know that it's your place she wants they want a scarlet thread to be put on the window and so she would put out a scarlet thread we go to Joshua chapter six we see the account of whenever they go around Jericho uh, that they in seven days basically you got the six days where they go around and they yell and then you got the seventh time when they go around and then yell again the walls come down and they go in and they utterly destroy everybody with the exception of Rahab and her household uh, and obviously the scarlet thread that was there in the window was to indicate of the fact that this was the one that let us in and spared us because she believed God so again what is significant or a big deal here This is somebody that is not, again, of the house of uh, Israel. She's not of the lineage. None of the promises are to her. In fact, she's somebody that's supposed to be destroyed. And beyond that, uh, she's somebody that is, well, she's a harlot, okay? Um, interestingly, most of the individuals that you would read about later in the New Testament, for some reason, with the exception with her, um, you don't read about, or they're, they're written about as if like their sin is not looked at as far as the ones that were believers that were faithful to God. Um, here's what I mean by that. It's like when you have Lot, uh, he's called the, this, he's a righteous man, he's just Lot. So we know he was a believer because of, Peter mentioned the fact that he was righteous and he was just. Um, but there's no mentioning of all the other stuff that had gone on when we read about him in the Old Testament as far as that he had... Well, we know that he vexed his soul with the conversation of the wicked. So in other words, he put himself in a position to be vexed uh, because of worldliness, basically. Giving himself over to the world and not having a heart for God as he should have as in following Abram's example. Um, and then you have, as David, the man after God's own heart. Uh, granted, he did sin with Bathsheba, and that's not something to be overlooked or something to be downplayed or anything like that. But again, he's spoken of in, in good measure. Right? And then she'd be the only one. No, she is spoken of in good measure because she believed God. And then not only was it counted her for righteous, but also the fact that uh, she spared um, the spies' lives. Uh, by not giving warning to the soldiers, but also the fact that it ended up sparing her life. And she would eventually be in the lineage of Christ. If we look at Ruth chapter 4, in the genealogy there, uh, verses 18 through 22, and then in Matthew chapter 7, uh, 1 through 17 is where the whole listing of the genealogy, but in particular 4 and 5 where it speaks of, it's mentioned that uh, Boaz... Uh, basically came um, from Rahab. Okay, so Boaz uh, was part Gentile. Um, and then he, she married a gentleman by the name of Salmon uh, because Salmon's mentioned in the other genealogies in Luke and in Matthew as well. Uh, but in Matthew particularly identified, and also in, in Ruth. Uh, so Salmon was somebody of the line of Judah, and he would have been 
within not only somebody that would have been in the line of Judah, but he would have been somebody that we see, we follow genealogy, it's going to lead to Christ. So he would have been somebody that would have of, of royal heritage there within the line of Judah. Okay, so this individual who's an upstanding, it's conjectured that he might have been one of the two spies uh, that were there, but I don't know, I don't, again, that's, that's conjecture, that's some of the, some of the commentaries and some of the, the Bible dictionaries that I was reading, that's conjecture, but that there's no, I don't have any way to like, tie that. All I know is that Solomon uh, was of the line of Judah, and he would have been a kingly line uh, because he's within the line of Christ, and then he married Rahab, and then Rahab, what did she do? Beyond the fact that she spared the spies, and then caused for her household, what more do we see of her? Well, she married, and then she raised at least one child to be godly, Boaz. Um, it could be that she had many more. They're not named. Um, but we do know that she did raise one uh, godly young man who grew up to be uh, Ruth's husband. And then, again, have Obed, which in turn would raise David. And so it, within the line of Christ, and so her faithfulness to seeming insignificant things, okay? Well, the harboring of the spies wasn't necessarily insignificant. That was pretty important. Uh, but raising her kids. I mean, beyond, uh, beyond, beyond harboring the spies, what else do you do? She's a housewife. Okay. I mean, yeah, she was formerly a harlot, but the fact is she was a housewife. So she was faithful to be diligent to what God had for her in her life and her role. And it seemed nothing special, nothing significant, but she was faithful to do that, raised a godly son who in turn would have godly kids and raise them godly and faithfully and down the line. And she's in the line of Christ. Okay, so we look at her life. Uh, she was faithful to God. Obviously, God bless. Go to Acts, the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 13. Well, Acts chapter 12, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. that they would have been a tribe. Again, this is just what I'm what I gathered from when I was reading as far as they're thought to be a tribe, a nomadic tribe that was in Midian. Okay, so they would have been they were they would have been Kenites, so they would have been in the land of Midian, so they would have been any other number of nomadic tribes that would have been in Midian, the land of Midian. Uh, and so they sojourned there um, in Midian. And then we're able to go ahead and go in and follow follow Israel then. Um, so they didn't, they didn't really have any ties, other than just they were they were exposed to Israel and then uh, they you know they uh, they were given the commands that they were given by their forefather and then they just followed them. Uh, Acts twelve. Well, okay, just read verse eleven. And then when Peter was come to himself, he said, "Now of a surety." Uh, Okay, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And then verse 12, And then when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. Okay, now this is in the book of Acts where you have Peter that was taken prison because he had, again, been preaching, uh, taken prisoner, taken to prison, uh, because of preaching in the synagogue, and then after he had been told countless times, after he and John had been beat, and they had counted him worthy, and after he had healed the lame man, uh, and then he's again preaching, he's caught, uh, he's sent, and then he's put into an inner prison, and more than likely, it's expected that he's going to be killed. 
Uh, while in the inner prison, he's fast asleep with two cards to his side. Uh, Angel of the Lord comes, and then boom, his chains fall off and wakes him up. He actually has to prod him on his side pretty hard. And then he wakes up, and he seems like he's in a trance. It feels like he's in a trance. And so he leads him out. He opens the doors of the inner prison, and he's able to get out to the courtyard and able to go out further. And then finally, when he's outside of the actual prison altogether, then he's awoken, and then he's like, whoa, did, this was really real, you know, was the angel. And then he, that's where we, we pick up there that uh, I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And I believe it was in response to the believers uh, there that were at that, this lady Mary's house who happened to be the mother of John Mark praying. Okay, now, uh, that's just the context. So we first mention of Mark, the surname of John, or, or John, surname of Mark, John Mark, uh, his mother is uh, a lady by the name of Mary. And then she is a believer, obviously. He's a believer. Now, we know he's Jewish, and we come to find out that he has an uncle by the name of Joseph, who's also known as Barnabas. In, for, uh, excuse me, in Acts chapter 4, towards the end of the chapter, uh, in particular, it's uh, 36 through 37, we see that Joseph, uh, who's going to be called Barnabas, uh, son of conciliation, that's his nickname now, or son of consolation, conciliation, son of consolation. He is an encourager. He's one of the first that comes alongside to encourage the Apostle Paul after he was saved. And then he was responsible for Apostle Paul coming to Antioch. He was also uh, numbered among the brethren that are there. He was man of, if we read about in Acts 4, he was actually a, a wealthy gentleman. Uh, he was a Levite and then of the country of Cyprus. Okay, so he would have been Jewish, but he wasn't uh, a Hebrew. In other words, he wasn't, he was, he lived, he well, modern-day Cyprus is kind of disputed between Turkey and Greece. But he lived out on an island in the Mediterranean, and then he had, it says here, having land sold it and brought it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he would have been somebody that would have been of uh, kind of wealth and background, too. And of the individuals that uh, traveled with Paul, uh, it speaks of, and, and we go down to chapter, uh, chapter 13, uh, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, which would later be named Paul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Paul and Bar or Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So now they are somebody, just teachers in the church. Um, and they're being greatly used of God, and then the Holy Spirit calls them in particular for a task. And they're going to go out, and we read that uh, go down to verse. It's verse 13 is where he's mentioned where he departs. Well, verse 5. Okay, and then when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. So in other words, John was a servant to them. John was there, brought along as part of the group that was with uh, Paul and Barnabas. And uh, they went to island uh, Salamis, we read the full account that what's going to happen is they're going to come across a gentleman by the name of Elimus who is a sorcerer and then he is challenging them and Paul uh, it seems like he got angry and then just pronounced cursing on him and he was blind for a period of the season uh, and then having dealt with that uh, again conjecture on my part I don't know that that's the cause of him having to flee but we read in verse 13 it says, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Okay, so John says, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Okay, they haven't finished their course that God had set for them. They're basically in transit from one area to another and going about what God had called them to do, and he's supposed to be along as a minister to them, as serving them. 
and he says, I'm gone, I'm out. That's it, I'm going back. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, go to chapter 15. He basically abandoned them. Okay, he leaves them in a, in a, in a bad spot. Uh, verse 36. Go down to verse 36. Again, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, this is after they've already returned and then they've had uh, given account and uh, given account of what had happened, how, what great things God had done during their trip, during their first journey. And now you have a big uproar, not really necessarily an uproar, but you have a big contention, it seems like, with the Jews at Jerusalem saying that, how is it that Gentiles could be saved? You know, they need to follow the law. And then they go down and they say, look, listen, God's not a respecter of persons. Uh, we've seen this already in Acts chapter 10, where uh, Peter was called to go uh, to Cornelius. And then he'd seen, you know, God had blessed and he'd seen Cornelius saved. And God's not, he determined, you know, God's not a respecter of persons as well. And so now they make a determination at that council that they had there saying, you know, we're not going to lay any burden more beyond uh, to the Gentiles because they're they're not under obligation to follow as far as the law. They're not they're not Jews, they're, so they don't they don't have any obligation to that. Um, but for the sake of the testimony that they have with regard to Jew believers and even non-believers that they're trying to reach, uh, we would that they would abstain from fornication and then from things strangled and you know from blood. Uh, because there, there, there are many Jews in the areas of where they're at. And so, anyway, so and then after that, they're now making a determination, hey, let's go back and follow up on these people that we've been able to reach and we've seen grow. Uh, we want to see how they're doing. And then, uh, verse 37, Barnabas determined to take with him John Mark, or John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder uh, one from the other. And so Barnabas took a mark and sailed to Cyprus. And then Paul chose Silas de and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended uh, by the brethren unto the grace of God. Okay, so they said, okay, boom, we got to go our separate ways. Now, who was right here? Well, you could say kind of both were right, uh, in a sense. God used both teams. Uh, Barnabas, as his manner was, was to come alongside and encourage somebody. We will later read in Colossians 4, in Philemon verse 24, and then in 2 Timothy 4.11 that Paul mentions in particular Mark as being somebody that he recommends and he's given uh, instruction with regard to as a minister, as somebody that is uh, serving and ministering in ministry. And then, in particular, in 2 Timothy, he comes, and this is right before Paul's getting ready to die. Uh, he is uh, writing to Timothy, and he says, you know, bring John Mark with you because he's profitable for me to the ministry. Now, that's a 14-year time frame from whenever he had first departed from them that we read about in Acts uh, 13 till whenever we read that, si uh, Simon, that Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy from Rome. And so, anyways, Barnabas was able to take him along and basically get him to a point to where now he's useful. In other words, he's restored to usefulness again. Um, now you say, okay, what's the deal with all this? All right. Just because you find yourself in a state of unfaithfulness or just because you quit or you choose to go and be unfaithful uh, doesn't mean that you can't get right and be restored to faithfulness again. In other words, where you find yourself now at this point, uh, if you are, continue on. If you're not, confess it, get right, and you can be restored. That's what God's desire, God's heart is. Um, now granted, it might mean that there might be some consequences as a result of being on a decision. We see that whenever Barnabas and Saul were going to go on their uh, second journey to go ahead and reaffirm or confirm uh, the churches that they had already established and the believers that they had already seen come to Christ, um, that he didn't want to work with them. Okay, so now he had to deal with the fact that, hey, this guy's, <laughs> you know, 
Barnabas say, hey, let, let's give him a chance. Let's let's bring him along. And then Paul's like, right, he's not trustworthy. And legitimately, that's a good argument. He wasn't. I mean, how do you trust somebody that abandoned you, you know, in the middle of the work? You know, he, he brought along for a specific task, and he's like, I'm out. Boom. I'm done. You, it's, you have that breach of trust there. Uh, now, granted, he proved himself when he worked to be able to be in a position where he could be trusted to rebuild that trust, but there might be some consequences to your unfaithfulness. Okay? And that's not judgment, that's just natural outflowing of consequence. Uh, there might be a swell as far as judgment if you continue on in being unfaithful, but the fact is if you are in a position where you find yourself being unfaithful or God calls you out that, hey, you look, you're not being faithful, you can confess it, you can get right, and God wants to use you, God wants to restore you to a measure of faithfulness. Now, Colossians, uh, Colossians 4, Colossians 4, for our final one, Colossians 4. There's only three mentions of this individual. Uh, Colossians 4 and then verse 14. Uh, Luke, well, you know what, go back to... Yeah, just verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. And then this is Apostle Paul writing to the church of Colossae. And he's telling him number of different things and now he's at the end of his letter and he's giving salutation uh, to them and he's also asking that you would salute other brethren that are there and so he speaks of Onesimus he speaks of Epaphras who in particular was the individual that brought the gospel to them he's a faithful minister he's their pastor so Paul actually never went to the town of Colossae he was the one that uh, preached at Ephesus and then while there, Epaphras would have gotten saved, and then Epaphras went back to his hometown of Colossae, brought the gospel, was able to see folks saved there, church growing up, and then uh, it happens to be that Demas is one of the many individuals that accompanied with Paul and served alongside Paul. So he's mentioned here, but there's nothing other than just the fact that uh, he's mentioned along with the other individuals that are faithful, that are um, serving alongside with Paul. And it just says, okay, Demas... Uh, greets you, along with Luke, the beloved physician. Okay, go to Philemon. Philemon. And then verse 24. And again, it just seems like it's one of those things that just is in passing that is mentioned. He's along with the group. Philemon, and then it says Marcus, Aristarchus. Marcus being John Mark, okay, as well. And then uh, Demas, and then Lucas, my fellow laborers. Okay, they are co-laborers with Apostle Paul. So these are believers. He's a believer, and he's somebody that is just alongside, along with many of the others that have company with Paul, serving faithfully, serving the Lord. Okay, he's a he's a fellow laborer. And then now go to Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. Verse Verse 9, it says, Do thy diligence to come to me shortly. This is, again, Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. It says, For Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, and only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Um, and so he's giving instruction here to Timothy as far as things that he wants. He's going to tell him as far as he wants them to bring a cloak, with him, he's going to want him to bring uh, some parchments, some writings. Uh, I think it's particularly the scriptures. And then he's also uh, telling him some things as far as, okay, bring, obviously, Mark. Uh, now, he had them with him as to minister, to help do things alongside in the team that he had. And then it says, do thy diligence to come short unto me. In other words, be diligent. <laughs> Hurry up and get here, because I need your help. And here's why. Who would normally be faithfully laboring with me? Left. He abandoned me. All right, and that is Demas. Now, we don't know anymore 
with regard to him because he's not mentioned anymore in scripture whether it's not to he got right before he passed or whether he, he remained in that condition but as far as scripture is concerned that's the last mention that we have him he was faithfully laboring and then he just said boom I'm done and here's the reason why it says that having loved this present world okay having loved this present world uh, he served alongside Paul but he abandoned Paul because of wrong affection okay and that's something that we all have to be very cautious about uh, as we live in this world. Okay, we want to have an eternal perspective. We have to live here. Obviously, we have responsibilities that are weighing on us, and we have things that we need to do uh, that seem menial and, and very just tedious. But the fact is, we need to be diligent uh, to do them. Uh, we'd see them with Rahab. She was a housewife. Okay. Now, John Mark. Okay, we think, okay, he might, was he preaching? I don't know. He was a minister to them. He was serving them. Okay, so that means he might have been making food for them. He might have been arranging lodging. He might have been any of the number of little things that you could think about as far as somebody that would be helping along in, in a service team. Um, it, isn't, it isn't just, okay, limited to the preaching. But here this man was faithfully along for a certain point, and then he has his affections turned to that which should not be. So it's twisted now. And so he set his heart, um, which we're told uh, in 1 John not to. And he's, where 1 John tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, you know, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For the things that are in the world, uh, the lust of the eyes, and you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, are, you know, they're not of the Father. And they're going to bring death. And the fact is that um, we're going to end up having to stand before Christ ashamed and we're going to end up having to stand before him with gold, so, well not gold, silver, precious stone but we're going to end up having those things done in that mindset as wood, hay, stubble and it's going to be basically how Jesus said to Peter that uh, what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul that was spoken in particular in context to his disciples in other words you have a wasted life and, and that's not to say that you shouldn't be diligent about working and those things, but the fact is we need to have an eternal focus. I mean, we live here in a temporal world, but it's the, temp the temporal doesn't matter. It's the eternal, and we need to be diligent and faithful about those things so we don't end up, as a Demas, having our heart and our attention turned and our, uh, our affection twisted and then end up having something written like this about us. If, say, we go to read the story of our life, would you want this chapter, or would you want that to be said of you? Yeah, you know, I would hope not. I don't. And so we need to seek to be diligent, to be faithful, and to focus on that which God not only has said and has taught us in His Word. On 2 Timothy, he talks about it. He says it, he words it like this. Uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. It sounds similar to what he said in the uh, Gospel of Matthew when he talks about teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I'm with you all the way to the end of the world. And so, until Christ comes, uh, let's seek to be diligent about uh, following him and then setting our affection on things above and not on things of this earth. Okay, next week we're going to have the Finney family and then also Bill Rice. The third is going to be here with us and he's going to be in particular doing the Sunday school. Following that we're going to have um, two more lessons within this series and that's going to be practical things like in other words, how do I practically uh, develop faithfulness and then last but not least is obstacles to faithfulness. How do I remove obstacles? How, identifying obstacles of faithfulness and how do I remove them? Alright, well, we're dismissed.